Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Betty Cruz, and I'm with the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Our mission is to convene and connect people around global issues to build a thriving, competitive, and inclusive Pittsburgh. And our vision is for a globally minded and globally connected world that is equitable and just for all. This year, we are celebrating 90 years of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. So please follow us online for more upcoming programs and events as we celebrate and deepen how we gather on world affairs. Today's program is an important topic. It's on the Ethiopian civil war. What you need to know about the humanitarian crisis in Tigray. It's part of our human rights series. This series, <clears throat> excuse me, this series will touch on both national and international stories and topics that focus on relevant human rights conversations happening around the world. We want to thank for our partner for this event, the Union of African Communities in Southwestern Pennsylvania, for their partnership in helping promote this important topic here today. And thank you, Benedict Keelong, for joining us today as well. What you can expect in today's program is that we're going to hear opening remarks from our speakers. We do have one guest speaker who's going to be joining us from Ethiopia and he's having some connectivity issues. So we're hopeful that he'll be joining us uh, momentarily. But both speakers are gonna bring a different perspective to what's been happening on the ground. Please be sure to get your questions ready and send them our way through the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments if you're joining us on Facebook. Let's go ahead and get started. We're so grateful to you, Mike O'Brien, um, for joining us here and sharing your time with us today. Um, for all who are joining us, Mike is a humanitarian, is with the humanitarian organization FHI 360, where he serves as associate technical director in the crisis response department. He specializes in public health and operations in conflict settings, which most recently have helped him to lead a crucial emergency response effort in Tigray, Ethiopia. And then we hope to be joined later in the program by Mogus Solomon, uh, who's an Ethiopian lawyer based in Addis Ababa, uh, the capital of Ethiopia. First up, Mike, we'd love to hear from you on what your experience has been, if you can give us an overview of the current humanitarian situation taking place in Tigray and the surrounding regions. Okay, thanks, Betty. And uh, until Moses gets on, and maybe Moses can provide a, a better timeline. I'll give a little bit of a timeline just on the emergency. Uh, not necessarily the political dynamics that, that led to the emergency. I think there's, there's some great resources out there, especially on uh, Vox and Al Jazeera. They have some good timelines. But uh, just in terms of the current emergency in Tigray, um, around November 4th, there was uh, an offensive in the Tigray region by um, the Tigrayan People Liberation uh, Front, TPLF. Um, there was a conflict between them and the, the government of Ethiopia troops, which just led to, to further fighting, further conflict. Um, then around November 15th, somewhere in the middle of November, the Eritrean um, military became involved, um, you know, and there were some, uh, there were some incursions into, into Tigray as well. And then basically the fighting continued and just uh, escalated uh, throughout the month. Then by the end of November, I believe the, you know, the, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia said that the, the conflict had basically been concluded. However, the, the conflict still continued um, throughout the early uh, 2021. Um, until about middle of January, we didn't really have a good eye on the ground. We didn't really know what was going on in Tigray. Access was very limited for humanitarian organizations. Um, you know, there were different places that were off limits. And really, FHI 360, we've been operating in Ethiopia since the early 1990s, probably 1990, um, starting with the HIV uh, epidemic there. Um, and we've we've had people in Tigray embedded with the um, the Regional Health Bureau, and we still were not able to get much information out of there. So around middle of Ju uh, January, uh, FHI 360 was able to launch our first sort of assessment into Eastern Tigray. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, Eastern Tigray. And some of the, the West and uh, some of the central areas had already been covered by humanitarian needs. Organizations like IRC had been working with the refugees in, in um, you know, in an area uh, near a town called Shire. 
uh, but just in Eastern DRC or e Eastern Ethiopia, we really didn't have um, a good idea of what was going on. So when we launched our assessment, we really found uh, large numbers of displaced people, large food needs, um, the humanitarian or the health system. I won't say it was non-functional, but it had been highly looted. Uh, there had been damage to a lot of the infrastructure. Uh, pharmaceuticals had been destroyed, thrown to the ground. Some of the the key equipment, uh, you know, uh, X-ray machines or even just blood pressure um, cuffs had been destroyed, and the water systems had been destroyed as well. Um, and not things that you know, large explosives or you know, to the water systems, but just the small technical components that that needed to make those uh, systems run. Um, were had been destroyed. So we found people that were really in need of health services as well as uh, water was a, a crucial issue. Um, and we also found, again, like there were large numbers of displaced people, um, but then we also came across different armed groups as we moved through the region uh, in different checkpoints. Um, and some checkpoints were um, you know, government of uh, Ethiopia, and some were, were not government of Ethiopia checkpoints. Um, you know, so there were different military groups operating in the region. So it was very, um, uh, I guess, tenuous moving around uh, Tigray, Eastern Tigray. Um, but from our assessment, we really found there were also a lot of protection needs. Um, there had been um, some reports of different uh, war crimes, atrocities that had been committed. Um, you know, and just a real need for a, a gender response. There had been uh, acts of gender-based violence um, and there were need support for, for the survivors of those as well. Um, then we, once we launched our, our response, really we, we launched an integrated response uh, along with some of the other partners that were operational there. Um, you might know MSF uh, Medicine San Frontier. Mm -hmm. Spain was already heavily operational. They were some of the front uh, line workers and able to get in. Um, they recently pulled out just because they had suffered some some casualties. Um, there were three of their workers that were that were attacked and they actually had to close up operations. But um, um, to elaborate for yeah, those familiar MSF is Doctors Without Borders is also Doctors Without Borders in the US. Yeah. So so there were other there were some other partners that were able to provide some of the services. Um, but yes, we just saw continued with the continued conflict up through February and March. Um, we saw uh, more and more displacement into the larger city centers. Uh, we saw, um, you know, large food aid needs, and this was all due to sort of the conventional conflict um, between the the Tigrayan military and the government of Ethiopia military. Um, but then around election time, um, around June 21st, just before up to elections, I believe the TPLF started to um, take over some cities. Um, you know, whether the government of Ethiopia says that they were allowed to take it over and they withdrawn or whether it was by force doesn't really matter. Um, but the main thing is that once those areas started to become under uh, Tigrayan control, then there was some access within those areas, but uh, access into Tigray itself has actually been closed. So the airports had closed, all of the communications, uh, phone lines have been closed, all supply lines into Tigray have closed, uh, and all the banking has closed. So there's uh, basically no food, uh, no money to, to buy the food, no fuel, um, and really no way to communicate with people. So that's kind of the up to, um, I'd say, uh, June 21st and since then. Since then, we still have very little uh, eyes on Tigray. The communications are still down. Uh, there's only a few organizations that have had um, some satellite communications that were in place before um, June 21st. So they remain a little bit operational, but the banks still are closed um, and there's really not not a good way to get food and supplies in. The main roads through the other connecting regions, Afar and Amara remain basically closed down and the airports remain closed down. Um, only until recently, I believe last week, um, United Nations um, humanitarian uh, logistics, UNHAS was able to start 
getting uh, passenger flights up into Tigre, into the main town of Michele. And how long that'll, that'll last, I'm not sure. But at the same time, there's still, um, you know, limited allowance of how much money you can take into the region um, to be able to even, you know, buy your, your own personal food or hotel if you were actually going to go up there. So I can't imagine what the, the Tigrayans are actually using uh, for currency. Um, and yeah, we're just seeing a little bit less, we're seeing greater needs. Right now, there's, there's about 5.2 million people in, in need in Tigray. Uh, a lot of that is food assistance. Almost everyone there is, is in need of food assistance. We're seeing about 2 million people that have been displaced, which includes um, probably another 63,000 people that have gone across the border into Sudan, uh, so refugees. Um, and we're seeing basically a, a dysfunctional health system, uh, but really no way to get pharmaceuticals or medical care to, to people there. So we're seeing actually a, a very dire situation in Tigray. Wow, uh, thank you for, for detailing this timeline for us, Mike. And we wanna dig in a little bit deeper and again, inviting everyone from our audience, whether you're joining us on Facebook Live and you wanna submit questions in the comments, um, or if you're joining us on Zoom, uh, please put your questions either in the chat or in the Q&A feature. Uh, we wanna make sure we, we get to all of those. But a couple of, of um, ones on our end to get started. Can you say a bit more on how the conflict is regarded or characterized, um, um, categorized, excuse me, as it relates to international law and Ethiopian law? And I'm not an expert on interna international law, okay, but I have had some courses on uh, international uh, humanitarian law, so that's that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, according to humanitarian law, the the parties to the conflict are responsible for basically the the um, the care of the civilian population as well as humanitarian access. So, really, as a humanitarian um, organization, you know, we would rely on we would rely on whoever's fighting to to maintain and recognize our neutrality. That you know, we're neutral, uh, and all humanitarian organizations should be neutral, mm -hmm. including the United Nations. Um, that, you know, basically what we want to achieve is based on humanity, um, that we're not influenced by other governments, um, even though sometimes that's um, suggested we're not, um, and that those parties to, to the conflict would, are, are basically responsible to maintain that access. Um, so for instance, you know, attacks on the healthcare system, attacks on water system, attacks on food systems or disruption of food systems, um, intentional disruptions, you know, those do, those do violate humanitarian law. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, unfortunately, that's something though that, that we see. I'm not sure how many um, people within the conflict, the act, you know, the, the actors, the parties to the conflict actually know much about humanitarian law or, or necessarily respect it. So, um, while we would like to lean back and rely on it, and we can, you know, claim that it's it's not being, um, well, it's, it's being violated, um, it doesn't mean a whole lot sometimes in terms of operations. Right. So to a degree, it doesn't matter what you call it if folks aren't participating or acknowledging or honoring it. Um, what, as it relates to what sort of changes need to be made to achieve long-term stability in the Ethiopian region, um, and whether or not the international community has a role in helping regions affected by humanitarian crisis. Can, can you speak to, to what you see as, as, as the types of changes and the role that the international community plays? Okay, sure. And just to let you know, I, I was actually, um, I guess, seconded to the, the, the Ethiopian health cluster back in 2016. So I was a little bit a part of the discussions and the the conversation into in terms of, you know, what what kind of role um, could be played. You know, there are a lot of I guess there are a lot of dynamics. And I'm not an Ethiopia or regional specialist, um, but you know, if you look on the news sources, there are different um, um, contention points with Sudan and e Egypt, especially related to the the Gerd Dam. Um, so there's some of those things that really help to, 
I guess, destabilize the, the region because they're, they're unresolved and they're not agreed upon issues. Um, so there's those issues, but, you know, just in terms of Ethiopia itself um, and sort of how it, it became a, a democracy, you know, it really looked like it took a lot of different um, regions of the country to, to kind of come together and, um, and basically fight together to, to decide how they were going to, you know, to form. Um, and I, I would assume that some of those still have their own sort of um, ideas on leadership and agenda. Um, but we, we just kind of need Ethiopia to, to remain stable because it has been such a stalwart in the region, um, you know, when there's been ongoing conflict in other areas. So I'm not exactly sure what the international community can do except for to stay engaged. Um, if you look at the the news cycle, unfortunately, there are a lot of crises going on, and I I cover I cover our global uh, humanitarian needs. So you know my attention is looking at uh, Mozambique and to Myanmar and to Afghanistan, to the the Venezuelan crisis and the migrant crisis. So if Ethiopia slips out of the news cycle, if it's not important to to us here, um, and if we don't elevate that to you know our U.S. congressmen, senators, then it's not important to them. Then um, you know it's it's not going to necessarily receive the attention that it needs. Um, yeah. Thank you for for raising that because so so oftentimes, right? The question, at least from our perspective as well, is how can we um, help Pittsburghers see that what's happening around the world is relevant uh, uh, to our backyard, to our own community, that there are intersections between all of these different levels of oppression and what can we do? And you just said it right there, we can reach out to our representatives and make sure that the issue stays front and, and center. Uh, with that, actually, we're getting some questions coming in and we encourage everyone to keep uh, submitting those. Uh, we'll get to those in a moment, but we wanna bring into the conversation and, um, and add uh, Mogus's voice. Thank you, Mogus Solomon, for joining us here today. Uh, we did mention that there might be a little Wi-Fi issue, so I'm glad to see your face and to have you joining us uh, from, on the ground in Ethiopia. So just to give a brief introduction to, to folks who are joining us, Mogus is an Ethiopian lawyer based in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. So today he's going to offer us some valuable insight as both a legal expert and a first-hand witness to how the conflict in Tigray has affected the country as a whole. Um, Mogus, Mike had the chance to give a high-level review of the work that he's been doing from an international aid perspective. Can you just take a few minutes and, and orient us through, through your lens of what's happening on the ground? Can you be more specific? Sure, just what's happening as it relates to you as your own identity and your work as an attorney, what's, for somebody who's just learning about the crisis in Ethiopia, what do you want them to know? It's a very broad term, I don't know how to say it, how to express my ideas, but uh, uh, I mean, if I have to say something about, you know, what you have to know about Ethiopia is like, you know, uh, this conflict is not, now it's not an internal issue. It's, it's become an international issue. And everybody here in Ethiopia, almost everyone is feeling that it is um, an involvement of other actors, which is, you know, uh, pushing the issue further and further away from us. Mm. So we are not feeling that uh, uh, we are not feeling the support of uh, the international actors like you know the European Union, uh, the U.S. and other you know world actors who who can bring a change to the conflict, like you know who can push the other party. It's just a one party push. Like the government is always put on a spotlight but not the other party to the conflict. Thank you for sharing that. Can you um, maybe bring into a bit of what's at play with, with the conflict? So can you speak to either um, some of the ethnic dynamics or religious that, um, that are contributing 
uh, or otherwise affecting the current conflict in Ethiopia? And this is a question for both of you, for you, Mogus or, or Mike. Well, the ethnic dimension uh, to the conflict is apparent because this uh, ethnicization of the country has been going for a long time, more than 30, 40 years. So it has got its own role to play, but I don't think this is uh, the main issue to the conflict. Uh, it has got a role to play, but that's not the main issue. And religion as well. Well, you know, the regime, the former regime, TPLF, was you know using this uh, ethnicity or religion as you know the main stake to govern the country. So now this is not the issue. I mean, it's not the main issue to govern the country. So there is uh, you know some part of uh, I don't know the how can I say it. Uh, there is some kind of uh, uh, discontent about it, uh, especially from the TPLF. And uh, I think TPLF only stands by itself and it, it's not getting the support it, you know, it, it claims to, to have, you know, for, you know, having this issue uh, not being, you know, the main point of, you know, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, no, I think you. I think you're bringing important um, perspective into this, and to and to as you're saying, it's not the ethnic issue isn't the main issue. It plays a part. The the spiritual piece, the religious piece, is not the main issue. So maybe can you go deeper on again the specificity of, of what is the main issue? Of course, the main issue is you know uh, power. You know, the, the former regime is not in power. So I think that's the main issue. Otherwise, uh, a regional government, which was uh, opposite from power, was issuing for three whole years, issuing ultimatums every day, every other day before, you know, before the war. I mean, this, this is, I mean, it could be said, this is the first of its kind in the world whether it's in federations or uh, confederations, that one region can issue an ultimatum for the regional government. So there was a clear issue of power from the beginning. So that was going for almost three years. And finally, you know, the regime attacked the uh, armed forces, which were stationed in Tigray. Uh, I mean, in their own words, they tried to to dislodge them of the armaments and take over over that, so finally it failed. That's what happened. In a nutshell. Thank you for that, Mogus. Uh, Mike, would you like to add? Yeah, it's just that you know I would agree that you know there's when we look at our conflict sensitivity, there's a couple different things, and you know there's really two drivers of conflict, and one of them are resources uh, or power. And the other one are grievances. And I think if you look at the dynamics in Ethiopia, you know, you've got both of those different things. We've got existing grievances that have been unresolved. And then we've also got, you know, um, control of resources or those power dynamics, who, who's gonna control those. So for sure, um, you know, that, that's, that's there. In terms of ethnicity, and it's, you know, I think those are probably the, the two drivers, um, you know, for, for conflict and, for the start of the conflict, continuing the conflict, um, but just in terms of going forward, and you know, as humanitarian organization, one of the things we really want to look at is just the protection issues, um, not necessarily for for Tigrayans inside of Tigray, but if you can think about, you know, what are some of the tensions that are starting to build in other parts of the country, um, you know, for instance, even moving non-Tigrayans into to Tigray to um, provide humanitarian aid. That's one of the things that we're a little bit hesitant about. Um, not because we know there's going to be any target, but, you know, as a humanitarian organization, we really don't want, we want to be, be careful with, with the risks that we, you know, we would ask our staff to take. So, um, you know, we have to, to be cognizant of that. Um, and then, you know, 
as I was talking about a little bit before we started the, the program, you know, there's existing uh, Eritrean refugees inside of Tigray. Um, so I think that needs to be, you know, considered. So while ethnicity might not be the main driver, I think it definitely needs to be considered how those tensions or identification uh, move forward just to make sure that, um, you know, civilians are not necessarily uh, targeted and uh, put at risk. Uh, yeah. Great. We want to bring in some questions from the audience. Uh, first one that we have is whether, Mike, this is this is for you. And of course, Mogis, please also feel free to join in. Uh, but Mike, do you have any, uh, any idea if the neighboring countries are involved in some way in the conflict to the degree that you can speak to that? No, I mean, I don't. And, you know, and it, it would be speculation to say if there's, okay, well, there's, 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 there's Eritrea and they definitely uh, have been involved, um, you know, in the conflict. Uh, and that's, that's kind of been widely acknowledged um, in the media, wasn't necessarily acknowledged, but I'd also say that I've seen them firsthand, um, you know, uh, in Tigray. So I, I think that that's, you know, that's, that's fine. I think we can acknowledge that. But just in terms of the other influences, I, I could only speculate, honestly. And there are other countries within the region that have um, competing interests. And I think, you know, as I mentioned, I might've mentioned maybe the GERD Dam um, is, you know, is one of those big ones and water, you know, water scarcity is a major consideration in, in that region. Um, so that, that could be a potential driver. Um, and, and people have their, their reasons to see things uh, succeed or fail. Um, but I don't have any proof and nobody's actually come out and said, whether they are um, whether they're supporting the government of uh, Ethiopia or the TPLF in terms of the um, you know the conflict. So now Mogus spoke to power. We do have another follow up question um, asking for a little bit more specificity. If you have anything else you want to add in terms of the cause of the conflict between Ethiopia and Tigray, is, is how the question is framed. Is there anything else? I'd say Mogus Mogus put it. Oh. Sorry, were you? I'm sorry. Were you asking me or Mogus? Well, either of you. Sorry, I will just say that Mogus put it pretty well, just in terms of the, you know, the Tigray region basically had been in power for 30 years in terms of the government. So, I, you know, I think that's you know three decades of of, of um, you know high level influence. But I'll I'll defer to Mogus. Thank you. But I, I should, I think I should correct you with the terminology first. Uh, there is no conflict between Ethiopia and Tigray. There is a conflict between the central government and TPLF to begin with. So Tigray is part of Ethiopia. We should all agree on that terminology first. Uh, I mean, it's, it's so amazing that, you know, there was a much more severe problem uh, in Ethiopia, like uh, a couple of years back, like between uh, Ethnic groups in uh, and uh, the Gedi, but it's a national issue. The displacement from that conflict was like uh, around a million people were displaced from their homes. But now, why is Tigray an issue for the international community? I mean, even in, we have elevated, uh, even when it comes to the terminology, everybody is saying, every media is saying that a conflict between Ethiopia and Tigray. Now it's not a conflict between Ethiopia and Tigray. There is an interest group in Tigray, that is TPLF, which was in power, which was ousted from power. So they have their own interests, like Mike, Mike said. There is an issue of resources, there is an issue of power. So it's not a conflict between Ethiopia and Tigray. The conflict is with the former regime. So I think we should correct that terminology to begin with. Uh, about the question, uh, I think uh, this issue, uh, I think we should always give room to, you know, the central government, like you always do, like everybody does that. The central government has a responsibility for law and order. And they are, that's what they are doing. So, I mean, this is being taken out of the context. Nobody is seeing that part of the conflict. 
So I think uh, we should probably consider the role of the central government, how it can handle it, how we can support it. I think uh, the international community should really come back to that area of the conflict. Thank you so much, Mogis. And language is important. And thank you for illuminating exactly the specificity of how we should be talking about who's in conflict and how and the realities at play. Can you share a little bit more for, again, our viewers, folks who are tuning in who don't understand what life looks like on the ground right now? And we've started to talk, we've talked about obviously water shortages, famine um the conflict as a whole can you share a little bit more of what it's like to to just live and be on the ground right now i mean i i have no first hand information but you know since i'm in ethiopia we hear like you know you know close by information from the areas like the conflict now um, uh, we hear that you know convoys you know cannot travel into tigray right now like uh, in three parties, the one traveling from Afar, the one traveling from the Amara regions through the Dese, uh, uh, the Dese um, route is not even going through to, 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 to cry. So there is a problem. Uh, uh, and also, I mean, people around, <clears throat> for instance, in uh, Northern Amhara, close to Tigray. There is also displacement from that. We heard that also. It's not an issue of Tigray as well right now. No, there is also displacement in, uh, like we call uh, uh, Northern uh, Wallo region. Uh, well, no, uh, Northern Wallo, um, it's sub-region from the Amhara region. So there is also a big displacement from there. Uh, so I don't think, uh, I don't think any, I cannot say for sure that, you know, uh, how people are managing in Tigray, but we have scattered information and the situation is dire, obviously. It's very dire. And this important point on information sharing and what, what gets passed and what doesn't, again, just to bring that back to the point here to anybody who's joining and the importance of sharing the facts and what we do know to our elected officials to raise awareness for the issue so that there can be more um, sharing of this information and awareness and action. Um, what about the reality that this is all happening in this particular moment? Obviously there's a long history here, but what we're facing right now, in addition to the realities on the ground, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the, in the midst of this crisis and this uh, humanitarian response. Can you, um, Mike, can you speak a bit to, to how that's complicating things and what else would be helpful for our audience to understand of how COVID is at play? Fun, fun story, I actually contracted COVID in Ethiopia while I was on a mission back in February. Um, so unfortunately, and this is this is true in a lot of different countries, there are a lot of different um, problems besides COVID. And, and COVID is definitely a problem. Um, but in a lot of the, especially humanitarian uh, settings, there are a lot of other issues, food, uh, conflict, malaria. Yeah, there are a lot of just other things besides COVID that is not so front and present. Um, so unfortunately, back when I was when I was there, the restrictions were a little bit loose, um, and and at some point, you know, uh, I think Tigray had like a twenty five percent prevalence rate. It was super high, um, yeah. just because you know there were it was the last thing on anybody's mind. Um, but since then, I would say the the biggest issue related to COVID has probably been a little bit about the travel, some of the travel restrictions or some of the considerations that need to be taken when you're doing meetings and things like that. Uh, but I would say it hasn't really been that much of a, an influencer um, on the response or kind of on, on daily life and a lot of, uh, from what I saw in, in Ethiopia, um, you know, focus. Yes, I would agree with you. I mean, it's more of like uh, COVID is not that much of an issue. For instance, you can say that uh, some of you know the 
I don't know how to say it. It's not an embargo, but you know, uh, there is a lot of rest restriction on you know the inflow of foreign currency like FDI or something else. So that is a big issue in Ethiopia than COVID. Like we can't get you know the necessary stuff. You know, Ethiopia is a dependent country on importation. So these days, you know, inflation is too high because of shortage of foreign currencies. So, I mean, that has affected life hugely in Ethiopia. I mean, whether it's a conflict or other areas of life. So I would really, I would really not, you know, concern about COVID. This day, especially this past um, uh, eight or nine months, it's not an issue even in Ethiopia. Everybody goes around as if COVID is not around. Everybody does that. So, I mean, uh, we're not sure, you know, of the data who who is getting infected because we can't test everybody in Ethiopia. So, but it's not an issue in Ethiopia. It's you know, inflation and you know, inflation is more of an issue in Ethiopia than COVID. Thank you for for adding some light to that, Mogus. We have a comment and question from an audience member who uh, was saying that, you know, I think the issues are coping uh, directly with their sharing, that they think the issues are not resources and grievances, a rehash of the debunked greed versus grievance framework of the World Bank, but has more to do with the former regime's leadership, the TPLF's refusal to accept Abai's po prosperity party, excuse me, and having the military capability to resist it violently, this is an issue of politics, as Mogus is saying, power. One of the problems of so many American analysts of African politics is that they assume it's a matter of ethnicity, religion, et cetera, but rarely political issues that demand a political resolution. Um, they elaborate with a, qu a question for you, Mogus. Uh, would you share why the regime resisted mediation by the African Union? And what do you think of Eritrea's involvement in the domestic conflict in Ethiopia? You mean which region? You mean the central government? You are breaking up a little bit the um, Abai reg regime and why it resisted med mediation by the African yeah. Union. You mean the central government? Uh, am I breaking some? You're, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, Hello? Yes, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can so, hear you. Yeah, I'm. I'm reading the question as it is. I'm not sure of the specificity, but to the degree, if if you can speak to. Okay, I just got some clarification here. Uh, the central government's current regime. Okay. Uh, well, of course. I mean, uh, mediation. All, all should come after there is no. Uh, first of all, it's an internal issue. We should give us government in a space if it can settle this issue by its own. We haven't even seen that the central government could handle this issue by itself. It's just everybody, I mean, the international community, especially this government and the European Union, got involved immediately without you know, considering that the central government could handle the issue. Mogis, right. I think you're broken up. I think you're breaking up quite a bit. So I'm gonna ask maybe if you can turn off your camera and let's let's see if that will work. Um, but you were breaking up quite a bit. Sorry about that. So can you hear now? Let's give it another try. Okay, okay, good. Can you hear me now? Yeah, let's go ahead and give it a try and see how it works. This is uh, okay, the reality okay, of a live live virtual program, technology issues. Please go with it. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, you know, the this conflict international, just like in a second. You know, without the central government being given a time to handle it, if it can handle it by itself. So, I mean, you know, from the start, 
got to know that the, the regime has failed uh, to, I don't know, we can say that, well, of course, in, in their act of, you know, taking over the uh, region, it's becoming very unusual. Okay, so, I guess I'm going to pause so you. I'm so, African... I'm so sorry. The it's okay. choppy. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. It's, chop it's choppy again. So let's, uh, Mike. Is there anything that you would like to add to this while we wait to see if Mogus's uh, connection stabilizes? Fortunately, I don't really have anything in terms of the internal politics or even the external politics, and you know. Um, how, how that all relates to resolutions. The only thing that in terms of the humanitarian operations that we see, whether they, they create a resolution, peace agreement, whatever it comes down to is just to, to make sure there's humanitarian access, all parties to the conflict, ensuring that you know supplies can get in, that uh, humanitarian workers can get in, that we have visibility and we're able to, to do that. So however that's achieved, the end result, um, it's, it's fine, it's, but that's our, our main goal, I think. Sure, and to that end, are there any differences in the way that humanitarian organizations such as yours, FHI 360, can support individuals displaced within Ethiopia by the conflict versus those who have become refugees in surrounding nations? Yeah, so we've had to, we've had to really be creative in some ways. So for instance, you know, because of the, con because of the conflict, um, you know, especially leading up to the middle of June before that, you know, the active conflict, we weren't able to access some different areas. So what, for instance, for, for medical services, uh, we weren't really able to pr provide support to some of the health facilities. So we were identifying doctors, nurses, other healthcare workers who had already been displaced and supporting them to be able to provide in their displaced camps or, or settings that, that they were able to do that. Um, you know, we're trying to to get some other low cost um, interventions up there that don't really rely heavily on a lot of water usage. Uh, like there's this product called Super Tal that we're, we're trying to, to get in. And it's basically an anti-microbial uh, towel as opposed to you know, setting up a lot of hand washing stations and things like that. Um, you know, and we're trying to really work with, um, you know, we're trying to work with the folks on the ground just to understand what their access is and how we might be able to to pivot as opposed to, you know, just the, the big lot of trucks moving in convoy and, and getting everything there. So, but I, I still think at the end of the day, it's going to be what the supply line looks like. Um, you know, the Office of uh, Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs from UN, UN OCHA is really estimating that's going to take 500 to 600 of those large trucks full of food and supplies every week um, to be able to deliver aid in those areas. We just don't have access. Um, and there's definitely needs, humanitarian needs in the rest of Ethiopia. Uh, fortunately, we do have access uh, or other humanitarian organizations do have access to those places. It's just getting uh, supplies into Tigray to, to work with that, those 5.2 million people um, that, that are in need is yeah. basically the issue. 5.2 million people. Anything else that comes to mind that you can share in terms of ways that folks can take action from wherever they're they're watching this program today? Yeah, you know, usually the pitch is money, right? So it's like, you know, if you could just donate or whatever, but really the money is not the issue here. I really think it's, it's really, um, you know, whatever your take is on the, the conflict, um, that's fine. But just making sure that you know, it does receive um, international attention that it stays in the news cycle. Uh, I think Mike Doyle is your uh, U.S. Congressman for Pittsburgh. If you're, you know, if you're from Pittsburgh, you're in Pittsburgh, you know, um, contact him and tell him it's, this is important and why it's important and what you'd like him to do. Um, and if you're not in Pittsburgh, then find out who your U.S. Uh, representative is and then, um, you know, contact them and make sure that this stays uh, as an important issue. Otherwise, it's going to lose out to Afghanistan. It's going to lose out to Myanmar. It's going to lose out to Venezuela. Um, but if those are your issues, that's fine too. You can also uh, stay engaged in those. Mogis, I uh, want to bring you back into the conversation. Hopefully, we'll we'll have a bit more of a stable connection for this last part. 
Would you like to pick up where you were or any other reflections that you want our audience to know? Uh, okay, let me try if you can hear me now. Perfect. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I was, I was just saying that, you know, the, the involvement of other international actors like the African Union, should, you know, it, African Union or other, other actors should be given a chance when, you know, the central government fails, you know, or at least there is, you know, some kind of, you know, like, uh, you know, a loose way which you can, you can say about the central government or that, you know, other, other actors could be involved in the, you know, in mediation or other staffs, but we haven't given the central government, the Ethiopian government, you know, to get, you know, the law, uh, uh, law and order situation under control. So it went from being a, a local issue to an international issue just within a day. So that's really, that's really the point. I mean, I would really disagree with Mike that uh, when we, well, when it comes to, you know, like, you know, assistance, uh, you know, the food and other staffs, it's, it's of course necessary, you know, to, you know, to keep updated, to follow up the issue. But otherwise, when it, when it comes to the conflict, we should always focus on both parties. Now the focus from the international committee is only on the Ethiopian government, on the side of the Ethiopian government. We always forget that there is always two parties to the conflict. So what about TPLF, you know? So it should be an issue as well. So, I mean, uh, the question which, which was directed to me, all focus on the central government. That's what I you know, understood. Mm -hmm. That's my point. Thank you for that, Mogus. Mike, would you like to add anything? I would just say that, I, I think I've said it all, all along, um, access uh, needs to be granted by all the parties of the conflict. So I'm not just pinpoint, I'm not saying government of Ethiopia, I'm not saying TPLF or Eritrea, whomever. Um, you know, it's, it's all their responsibility according to the international humanitarian laws. So the Geneva Conventions um, really calls for access. So all parties to the conflict um, need to make sure that, that there is uh, humanitarian access. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mogus. Any closing um, reflections from either of you at this point? Mogus, you, you also heard Mike speak to what, what other action can be taken. Um, again, we are uh, uh, located in Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but we have this conversation happening with folks joining us from different parts of the states and of the world. Anything closing that you wanna make sure that we know in terms of action um, that you'd like to see, that you haven't already spoken to? I would really uh, hope that, you know, the international committee also uh, puts a really big pressure on TPLF, you know, to act within the country, within the laws of the country, because, you know, now, now it looks like the consideration, like I said, the consideration is like, you know, the, you know, the displacement in Tigray. Now life is becoming, you know, really hard in Ethiopia as well. Like I said, inflation because of this, because of this conflict. So inflation, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, redirection of resources uh, to the war and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it really is a problem for the whole of the country. It's not just a problem uh, for the region, the one region, Tigray. So I think uh, the international community should also look into this factor. We are suffering from and will be suffering for a long time from, from this conflict. So I think they should always focus on both parties. I mean, we, we know that, that there are there could be other, other parties as well, but the main actors are these two parties and we shouldn't forget TPLF as well to this conflict. That's what I wanna say. Thank you. Thank you, Mogus. Mike, final word. Yeah, I would say, and this, is, this applies outside of um, you know, Ethiopia, uh, humanitarian organizations um, should not be involved in the peace process. And the reason for that is one of our primary principles is neutrality, which is basically that we, we don't really have a stake in the game about this party or that party or whatever. 
all of our emphasis is based on humanity, which means that we should be driven by solving or addressing suffering uh, as the primary um, interest. Um, we need to be independent, which is not influenced by any government. Even our US government, if the US government is providing grants, we try to remain independent or we should remain independent. Um, and we try to remain neutral. Um, those, are, those are some of the main things. Um, so I would really look to some of the other um, organizations, humanitarian or uh, other world bodies that really uh, should be driving the peace process where humanitarian organizations actually, we need to take a step back and just stay neutral and look at the suffering and try to make sure that we have access so we can, we can address that. That's what I would say. Excellent. Thank you both so much for your time, for helping us uh, shine the light on this important, important crisis. Uh, thank you, Mike O'Brien. Thank you, Mogus Solomon. Thank you to um, all of your thoughtful responses and participation, your questions, and very uh, much gratitude, deep gratitude to our friends at the Union of African Communities in Southwestern Pennsylvania for being a partner on today's program. If you enjoyed our virtual program, please consider supporting the council. Uh, you can help us further our mission and continue to our, continue our work providing community programming. Uh, visit our website online, worldpittsburgh.org slash donate. Also check out our website and social media to get involved in other programs that we're having throughout the year as we celebrate 90 years of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Uh, today's program was recorded and all attendees will receive uh, the link as well as some of the resources that were shared at the top of the program. Thank you so much, everyone. Until next time, be well. Thank you. Bye.